Tonight I will tell you uh, like two presentations in one. So there's a story of a tool that I had the pleasure of helping building, which is designed to provide the obfuscation for iOS apps. But um, as we were building it, we also found, let's say, a technical approach to using the um, power that the Swift compiler offers to do uh, many possible uh, other uh, tools or products or solutions. And this is the other thing that I would like to share with you. But before that, let's just take a, have a uh, quick look at what the obfuscation uh, really is. Because the obfuscation term comes from obfuscation, and the obfuscation, as you can see, is basically um, a way of making the code less readable. So, <laughs> Of course, you're not doing it to, to uh, make your colleagues angry. Um, the idea is to uh, do it so that the attacker, the someone who tries to break into your app, um, has uh, well, some more things to, to work uh, with, to work through. So basically, the idea is as follows. You do have your source code, and you compile it into the binary file using Xcode, for example, then you upload it to the app store. And then this uh, bad person, attacker, downloads your app from the app store. Um, your app is encrypted at this point. Everything that you download from the app store is encrypted using the Fairplay, the same one that uh, iTunes uses. And the attacker has the jailbroken device. The jailbreak is available for all the uh, new uh, iOS versions. And um, when the app has been loaded into the memory, it's been decrypted. And if you have a jailbroken device, you can just use this memory dump, file, dump tool to basically dump all the memory um, into the binary, into the file on the, on the disk. And now you do have the encrypted binary file, basically similar or the same to the one that you have uh, got from the uh, Xcode. And then the attacker, <coughs> when they have the, library, the, the binary, can use a tool like Hopper, and it is assembly or the, the, the compiler, to turn the binary into either the assembly code or some kind of pseudocode. The Hopper, for example, uh, can give you a pseudocode. And this pseudocode just expresses the same logic that your app has. So the skilled attacker can basically read pretty much anything that you've put into the app from the pseudocode and the, and the uh, decompiled assembly code. Um, the analysis is done, as I said, in the tools, similar to the one that I'm showing here. This is a screenshot from Hopper. And basically, they show you the logic, the execution. This is the pseudocode that I was talking about. And also, they can allow you to perform like the whole set of analysis over your binary. For example, see all the symbols that you've put into the binary, see where they are defined, uh, follow the execution order, and so on and, and so forth. And the attacker then can, for example, try to understand some special algorithm that you've put into your app, because this is like the special app for the banking purposes or something like this. Or uh, they can easily find some API keys or something like this. The most basic obfuscation um, technique, let's say, is just simple renaming. This is not very complicated, but the idea is as follows. You just turn the symbols that you've seen here, like your view controller, some other view controller, and so on, into uh, long random strings so that the symbols are basically not carrying any meaning anymore, so that the attacker just needs to put more time to understand um, the logic. I mean, this is just one of many things that you can do to prevent your app from being like breached. And also, this is not something that will really like prevent anyone desperate enough to to go into the assembly code from getting what they what they what they need uh, or what they want. But this is something that will prevent probably some automated bots that are decompiling the apps and. Uh, any like non-skilled uh, attacker that is just having fun with your app from seeing what's inside. And long, long time ago, when 
those creatures were walking the earth and we all were um, co writing code in Objective-C then. Um, Being careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of us still do. <laughs> yeah, I can remember it as it was yesterday. Um, the obfuscation with simple renaming was even more like needed because anything that is available for the Objective-C runtime has to be um, put into the binary in a form of selector strings so that you can just basically call them at the runtime. And um, knowing the simple names make it way easier to understand the code. So this renaming was very important for Objective-C. But now that most of us, yeah, most of us are writing in Swift, um, things has changed. Swift is a compiled language that um, has a pretty heavy optimization during the compile, during, during, during the compile time. And um, also there is a possibility of stripping Swift symbols when you are building your app. This is like a flag in the build settings and this is uh, uh, an option when you are uh, putting your binary uh, to the app store. So the question may be, why do you need the obfuscation at all when you're writing in Swift? Well, you need it because anytime your object or your method or anything that you're uh, writing is not like a pure Swift thing, nor a pure Swift class, nor a pure Swift method, um, it's basically visible to the objective, it must be visible to objective uh, C runtime the same, the same way it uh, was before. So anything that is inheriting from NS object, from view controllers, UI views, and so on, anything that has this special at uh, OPJC um, attribute will be visible the same way that it was visible when, as, as, if you, as if you've written it in the Objective-C. Also, I mean, in general, simple renaming is only like a one technique for obfuscation. So there's, there are many more things that you can do. You can introduce some branches into your code that will be never executed, but they're done in such a way, introduced in such a way that the compiler won't strip them away during the compilation. You can probably take your API keys and um, change them so that they are not like plain strings, but they are behind some function that's generating them, and the function has a very convoluted logic. Anyway, there's a number of techniques. If you are interested, there is a very nice PhD uh, physics that I was looking through when I was getting familiar with the subject. This is the link. Of course, the presentation will be available after. Um, and yeah, this is like a nice overview of various code techniques uh, for obfuscation, and most of them is applying to Swift as well. So now that, now that we know that we might want Swift obfuscator after all, let's think about how we can approach the problem. So there are three main ways. You can do the obfuscation after the compilation, during the compilation, and before the compilation. And after the compilation means that basically you have built your app, let's say through Xcode, and you do have the binary, and then there is a tool that takes this binary and it just generates other binary that it's somehow transformed so that um, the decompiled code is harder, is harder to uh, understand. And the most well-known, for me after, uh, at least, commercial tool that does that is called IXGuard. Um, this is a tool be, uh, from the very well-known company um, GuardSquare. They are basically uh, famous for um, developing ProGuard and then the commercial um, version of ProGuard called DexGuard for Android. The second approach is to do it when you are compiling, so during compilation. Um, so along the process of turning your source into the binary, the example is the ProGuard tool that I've been uh, mentioning earlier. If you've ever touched the Android development, you've probably um, seen that ProGuard is just like a step during the compilation process. It's taking the bytecode that has been generated uh, with uh, Java compiler and changing it somehow before this bytecode is turned into the DEX. Um, and Swift compiler doesn't really support plugins so that you cannot really like put any special step the way that you can put it into the um, Android build process. If you want to perform the obfuscation during compilation uh, for Swift, you have to give uh, alternative compiler. 
that has it baked in. And this is exactly what the project called Obfuscator LLVM is doing, for example. And the third approach is to transform the original source before it's been compiled into the source that is, well, more difficult to understand after the compilation. Um, so if, if you're just thinking about the simple renaming, this is like a very strange refactoring that's taking your code and just making it, uh, making all the symbols totally unreadable. And we haven't really found anyone doing that. Um, so this is basically the main reason why we took this approach because we were we saw the, the the open space and we thought that yeah this is this might be interesting to to explore it and also I like this approach because this is the most transparent to the user um, if there is an, alter, an alternative compiler or some tool that's taking a binary and splitting other binary you do have to trust the provider of this tool that they are not injecting anything that's yeah, that's uh, malicious into your code. Of course, you can trust probably the company like um, uh, Guard Square, uh, although this is something that doesn't really require any trust on your part. If you see the source after the obfuscation, you can always just go through it and see what was changed, what was added. You can make a diff, so it's very like uh, transparent to you. So the goal at least for the first version and the only version that we've built so far, was to perform basically um, obfuscation of Swift code by renaming. So we wanted to change the code, for example, from something like this into something like this. So this is the, the main idea, okay? Um, the important part, <laughs> as you can imagine, is that it should compile afterwards, okay? <laughs> So <laughs> you are not, we're not just in putting any random strings anywhere, okay? This should compile afterwards. Um, so we can just have a very quick demo and see it in action, uh, or at least the results of it in, in action. So this is basically like an open source app by a friend of mine, uh, Maciek Oczko, uh, that is actually working with our uh, obfuscator. And this is the code before. And we can always just run this app and see how it, um, how it executes, how it looks, that it actually launches, which is not uh, that obvious because obfuscation, uh, if you're using storyboard or, or, or nips, uh, has to be done in those files as well. Otherwise, in the runtime, the loading from storyboards or nip uh, won't work. Mm. Okay. And as it's uh, launching, oh yeah, it's launching right now. Hopefully. Yeah, so this is basically the, the app. Um, the app is for coffee nerds to have a journal of the coffees that you've been drinking. <laughs> if, this is like a great app for that. I mean, if you are interested, this is open source and this is free on the App Store. So yeah, definitely, definitely check, check it out. Um, anyway, so this is, the, this is the app. And after the obfuscation process that I will not um, like launch right now just because it takes a little bit of time. This is the result. This is the same file, I guess. Yeah. So basically, this is before, this is after. And um, everything was changed in such a way that it still compiles and it, that all the public symbols, the public ones, so we haven't really worked with the, with the private uh, internal symbols, all the public symbols are being um, transformed. And this is like not on the, on the only file that has that. <laughs> every, every file uh, has that. Of course, we also have to exclude the um, system, um, system names and system properties like UIKit properties and so on. But the ones that we could, we have been obfuscating. Yeah, and the important thing is, of course, to see it launching. Um, yeah. So this is the second. Now that we have two copies of the uh, simulator uh, at the same time, this is like so, so, so nice. <laughs> I know it's not much, but this is something that we've been waiting for a long time. <laughs> okay. Although it's a little bit slower um, after the change. 
Anyway, so basically this is, this is also launching, this is also uh, doing, performing the same, the same work. Mm. So I guess that the answer to this question is a resounding, usually, usually it does. <laughs> usually it does. Um, anyway, um, what, we, what I've just demoed is not like a universal tool. This is basically built for a, one app that we really needed to obfuscate. So it has like a lot of things missing. We do not support um, generating the DSM files um, so that when you do have a crash in the source code that was obfuscated and you can just unload the uh, crash with the DSMs that are not obfuscated. <laughs> so you can see basically like the obfuscated stack for your crash, which is not the um, best solution right now. Um, we do not support multiple targets, so if you do have the extension in your app, um, sorry. Um, no uh, mixed Swift and Objective-C support yet. We've been working on it, uh, and it should be possible, but, uh, but we haven't really managed to finish it yet. And also, there are some Swift constructs that we didn't really uh, choose to support as of now. But it's still pretty powerful. For example, it does renaming in the SIPs and story in the NIPs and storyboards. Um, it has a huge range of Swift expression already supported. Uh, we do have the excluding configuration, which is pretty okay because if you do have a core a data model, for example, you do not really want those properties to change from release to release. And also, this is very easy to integrate, as easy as one uh, command line um, tool. So basically. We call it serious, obfuscator, because it's serious. Um, you're just giving it a path to the place that your Xcode project is in, and uh, the path where it should split out the copy of your sources that were obfuscated. We also support in place obfuscating, but this is not a default, just because we do really want to avoid the situation that you have accidentally <laughs> overwritten your uh, source code. So. You can integrate this either as a step in the build uh, process in Xcode or uh, just launch it standalone, for example, as your uh, continuous integration pipeline. But behind this one command line uh, interface, there's like a number of um, steps that we've decided to keep as modular as possible because, yeah, maybe we'll extend them in the future. So let's just quickly go, them, go through them one by one. First, we just search the path that you've been given us in, and, and try to get the Xcode project. Um, then the Xcode project is parsed using the library from Cocopods uh, project called Xcode Proch. Uh, it's in Ruby. Yeah, this, this part is written in Ruby. And we are trying to get all the source files in your Xcode project, uh, get all the required settings, build settings, also identify any dependencies like CocoaPods dependencies and so on to make them available when we, you, you, we will be performing the analysis afterwards. Then we do have the simple identi identification step that's basically for finding all the symbols in your source code. And then we are generating the new names for all the symbols, so the names also should follow the uh, Swift grammar, for example, you cannot put the same string for the method name and the op uh, operator name because operators have like a very limited number of uh, chars that uh, you can write them with and um, yeah, there are different, different uh, rules for different constructs in Swift. And finally, we, we are performing the actual renaming. So we are just taking the source code, making the copy of them or in place, as I said, and um, then changing the, the text in the files. We are also then processing all the zips and storyboards uh, so the app doesn't crash in the runtime. And each one of those steps is uh, like a separate command line tool and the main command line interface is just calling them one by one so it's like very simple. Uh, and also we've added like a very, very basic verification uh, script that's just launching the already available analysis tool just to show you the symbols before and after. But this is like the, yeah, this is the, the first part of the stack, as I said. And the second part is um, the approach that we took when we were building those three blocks, those three um, parts of our, of our obfuscator. 
because those three are built using the Swift compiler underneath. And they are being built as um, command line Swift compiler tools. Mm. One question you may ask is why uh, actually taking the Swift compiler at all into this whole um, uh, project situation? Um, the, analysis can be, the analysis can be performed using some other tool, but basically the compiler is something that has the most information. Um, any other tool, like for parsing the grammar of the language, anything else, is basically always giving you the information that is a little bit stripped. And if you are calling the compiler structures directly, and you are just calling the compiler functions directly, you do have the most information to decide whether you do should perform the refactoring or not. And uh, believe me, there are some very like, delicate constructs in Swift sometimes that should that are like really really difficult to identify um, and decide whether you are really able to to uh, rename them or not there is no like standalone library version for Swift compiler this is for example something that uh, Clang compiler has CLang uh, CLang has something called CLang lib I guess um, that you can just download and import in your uh, C code or C++ code and just call the functions from Clang directly. You cannot do that with uh, Swift compiler. So basically what we did um, was we found or we noticed that the Swift compiler has already the infrastructure for generating the executables that are able to link various parts of the Swift compiler um, internally. For example, the Swift executable, that Swift binary that you are calling, which you are compiling something, is one of those tools. So this is just some one other tool, uh, as you will see in a moment, that is built in the same, the same way, the same, uh, the same uh, architecture. So what I would like to give you right now is like a very short overview of how the Swift compiler um, inner structure is laid out in terms of adding the uh, adding new functionality to the Swift compiler, uh, so that if you ever maybe inspired by this talk, decide to uh, check check this out and 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 see what what what's possible, you you will have a reference for that. So this is like the Swift um, repository has been put on the GitHub, and the place that we should look for the tools is this tools. Mm, the folder, so yeah, the name it speaks for itself, and this is the place that all the Swift executables are being put into, and also like basically anything that the compiler produced for the external world to use is being uh, put into this um, into this uh, folder. Uh, two like pretty um, notable um, examples are SourceKit, for example, SourceKit, so the daemon that. For example, Sorcery uh, uses underneath, or SwiftLint uses underneath, and the, the, the Xcode uses underneath as well. It's been also defined here as a Swift tool. And also the driver. The driver is actually something that is pretty interesting because this is the yeah, main entry point for the compilation. So let's look into that. The, what's inside of this folder is just a list of C++ files. Um, and the main one that is uh, for, for, this, for this tool is called the driver CPP. And this is actually exactly the place that the execution start point when you are compiling any Swift source code using the Swift or Swift C commands. So this is like, yeah, something that you can uh, talk to your developer friends and say that you know after this talk, uh, do you know what happens when you just call the Swift uh, from the command line? Yeah, I know, the 113th line of the uh, um, driver CPP file from Swift Tools driver. So basically this is just like the very no, usual um, CPP file with the main function. This is something that we are pretty, probably familiar if you've ever, ever touched any C or C++ um, similar uh, language. To make the source file compile into the binary, the executable, you have to also like 
plug it into the Swift build system. And the Swift build system is based on um, something that's called CMake. Uh, with, with files called CMake list, they are defining what's happening when the compilation takes place. So if you want to create a Swift executable, you just need to make a CMake list file with add Swift host to um, Swift. And this is basically um, making uh, the compiler compile those things, link against those libraries, and also say that they depend on uh, various LVVM components underneath. You then need to also add the tool into the CMake list from the root directory. This is pretty, uh, this is like so simple. Um, CMake list is just traversing the file system and at each level it just looks for the CMake files. So basically you, say, you have to say that, yeah, this subdirectory is also something that you should look into. And um, yeah, if you, if you add it, it's just part of the compilation process right now. So basically if you want to make a new tool, this is like a very short reference, um, create new folder in Swift tool, <coughs> add it to the CMake list in the root directory, define your main function, make CMake list that states that this is the file that you should take the, and, and, and compile when you're creating your uh, executable. And yeah, just remember to add this add Swift host tool function. After you do that, for example, if you are doing the uh, obfuscator, you can see that after building, the compiler just split out new uh, binaries into the release bin um, directory. And this is fine, but I mean, how much of the logic can you put into the command line tool itself, right? I mean, this is not the place to, to I mean, it might not be a place for you to put like all the logic that you want to, um, that you want to uh, add it to the, to the tool that you're building. So the good idea is to define the library for that. And the, to define the library, you have to just look at the Swift include Swift uh, directory. And this is the director directory with all the H files. So this is basically for the interface. This is C++, remember? There were interfaces and, and implementations, just like in Objective-C. And then you just put all your H files into the, into the folder. And then in the lib catalog, you just put all your C++ code. Uh, the, the CPP code, so implementation files. As always, you have to add it to the um, CMake list in, at the root level, then define all those CPP files, and also then make CMake list for, the, um, for your tool at the, at the lower level as well. And here, with add Swift library, that has very, very similar um, parameter list that the one that you've seen with the host tool, you are just, you've just defined the library. <coughs> so basically the list is pretty much the same to make the library. Um, create new folders for headers and implementation. Put the headers to the folder in the folder that you've created, put the implementation there. Create to make list for the implementation directory with the proper add suite library. And then add the subdirectory sub to the CMake list at the higher level. And when you do that, you can see that now your static library is just been uh, compiled and um, uh, built by the compiler when you, when you just run the compilation process, which is pretty cool. Although there is uh, one thing that you've probably already thinking that are missing after the last talk, uh, where are the tests? I mean, how can we write it without tests? There's a place for that as well. So there is a Swift unit test uh, directory with the tests for all the unit tests that are, well, basically linking the uh, libraries. There are very few of them for the Swift compiler because almost all the testing for the Swift compiler is done through the integration testing. But if, if you want to add some, uh, just as usually, make this at the root level with subdirectory, then your tests in your directory and CMake list with this time add Swift unit test. You've probably already seen the pattern. Um, so this is just a reference 
you've already already, uh, already noticed how to how to add new functionality to the compiler. And after you do that, uh, this is actually a separate executable that's been generated, and this executable is just linked against your own library or any other library that you've cited in the CMake file. And when you run it, it just splits out the results of your unit tests. So yeah, this is basically for running the unit tests. And I've mentioned integration tests, like almost all the testing is done for the integration test for Swift compiler. Uh, Swift is using the tool from LLVM called Lit. Um, it's a Python-based tool, and uh, it has a slightly different syntax that I'm not going to go into right now. But the important thing just for the future is you need to look into this lit.cfg configuration file, and then you can add your own tool into the list of the tools that it supports. And then it basically runs like a command line runner, so it can just execute anything that you've put uh, into the test from the command line and see the output and then div the output. So this is basically it. So that's the whole, let's say, um, list of steps, the whole recipe for adding something new to the compiler. You can create your command line interface in Swift tools. Then the logic, that's very, it is a good idea to separate from the, from the tool into the library. Then unit testing for uh, your unit test for your library into Swift unit tests and integration tests to Swift tests. Um, and this is just exactly what we did for Swift Office Caster. So this is <laughs> the mystery is finally revealed. Uh, we created three command line tools: one for performing the analysis, the second one for rename for generating new names, and the third one for making the actual renaming. Um, but yeah, the most important reason why we did that, why we did all this research to know how to add something to the Swift compiler is that by linking to the Swift compiler itself, we can get the, something that it's not really available for any other public interface. There is no like any other public API that you could use that gives you what the Swift compiler gives you. And for us, it was this, abstract syntax tree. So um, basically, when you're just linking against libraries like Swift AST and Swift Parse, you can just tell the compiler very quickly in a, very <coughs> in a few lines of code, please take this arbitrary list of um, Swift core, source code file and generate the abstract syntax tree for them. And also, please make the semantic analysis for it. So make all the type checking, which is pretty awesome if you're doing the uh, obfuscator of, and any uh, refactoring tool uh, at all. So this contains like all the information that we needed. It, it, it tells you about the protocol conformances, it tells you about uh, what modules are particular symbols coming from, whether they're overwriting, overwriting something, um, whether they are from extension or not. I mean, everything is there, everything is there. Um, and this is like a very quick example of what you can do yourself. It's like just to show you how little code does it need when you are already having the Swift um, tool and you've already like added all those libraries to, to, to be linked against. You just have the ability to create new compiler instance and new compiler invocation. Invocation is just like a back for configuration. It's basically like the back for all the flags that the compiler takes. Uh, you put all that you need to uh, pro 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 provide the compiler for the compilation process into the uh, invocation. So like the module name, the target triple is basically s saying what architecture uh, do you want to compile, the SDK path, and so on. And most important, file names, right? All the file names. And then if the setup process is um, turning OK, you just call perform SEMA, and voila, you do have the, um, the AST uh, for all of the files. And the, fun, the good part is that you don't really need to even walk this AST then yourself, because the compiler already has something called, uh, for example, source entity walker. And this is only one 
class, the one that we've been using, but there's like a number of different walkers for different purposes defined in the compiler. Basically, you can be like a barbarian in the garden. You can just go and see all this beautiful construct that the compiler uh, creators has, 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 has done for some compilation purposes. Just take and smash it and do whatever you want because, I mean, no one, no one will judge you. This is your tool, right? <laughs> so <laughs> basically, you can do whatever you want. Um, so the one that we used was called source entity walker. And you can just please ask the compiler, give me all the files that I've, um, that I've, passed, uh, that I've passed to you. But in this source file, um, C++ object format, and this is already, this is a node uh, in the IST, so this is already a node. And this is like a root node for the source file. Uh, this is, you can just traverse it and, and, and see everything that was uh, done in this uh, source file. And then you just say, walk it. And it gives you the callbacks. There is a huge number of different uh, callbacks that it will give you. The one that I've presented here just for the, for the sample uh, is the one that each time that you see a node called a declaration, which is pretty interesting if you're doing the renaming of symbols, because basically symbol is usually declared somewhere. Uh, it just gives you a lot of information already parsed uh, just to use. For example, it gives you char source range, which is where in your file uh, has this uh, symbol been declared. It's just, it's just a pointer to that place in your file, which is awesome. And also there is like a number of other uh, things that, um, uh, yeah, if you're interested, I'm, I'm very happy to talk afterwards. And if there is something that is not being parsed by this uh, source entity walker, you can always get from the AST node, like parameter declaration, for example, that is expressing the parameter, like the, the one that you are declaring or using in your functions or your methods, and just ask it, like, <coughs> give me the name of it, the, the name of yourself, give me where are you located. And from that, you can always create the place in the source code that uh, this symbol is uh, being referenced. And after you did all that, you want to do the actual renaming. And this is also something that is so simple because um, the renaming process, if you are to do it yourself, can be a little bit tricky because if you change one symbol in one place, you have just changed the offsets of all the other symbols if the length of the symbol that you've put into the place um, is, uh, other, is, is different than the one that was there before. And because you want to generate like a long random strings, you're usually just making the offset further and further, right? And here, uh, there, is a, there is a class uh, from the other library that compiler uses. It's called Swift IDE. And this is the one that is actually responsible for providing the refactoring uh, engine for the Xcode. And all the refactorings that you can, for example, use from the Xcode are basically from the Swift IDE. And because this is like so designed to make changes in the source code, it has a very nice API and takes care of all the offsets, takes care of writing into the file, takes care of all the works. It's basically, this is basically the whole code that you need to put to make the, refact make the, make the uh, renaming. Whoa. <laughs> It's raining. Um, OK. And there is like so, so much more. As I said, no one will judge you. Uh, you can take whatever you f you, you'll find in the compiler. You can take whatever you'll find in the LLVM as well, which is nice, because LLVM is like a huge project. And there are some very strange things in LLVM. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, sometimes you are surprised what you find. And also, the Clang is part of LLVM as well. So you can use Clang as well. I mean, it's like you can take whatever you want and just do whatever you want with that, which is pretty awesome. Mm. For example, uh, one thing that, is, that comes handy when you're building command line tools is like parsing command line uh, in, in arguments. And you do not really need to write it by yourself because there is like a huge amount of command line tools in LVM and in Swift. So there's already a library uh, for that uh, that basically is it's so nice, it's declarative. You're just declaring that you want to have this parameter and it should be of the string type. You're just declaring the help uh, um, message 
and then you say parse command line options, and that's all. It's either there or not. You can just ask whether there is something or there is not. Is it empty or not? And if it's not, uh, there was this parameter pass, and if it, if, if, if it is, that it wasn't. So, it's, so that's all for the command line interface. And other thing that comes handy, um, JSON parsing is already there as well. Uh, it's also very declarative, very nice uh, um, programmers, those uh, people from the uh, LLVM team. Uh, you just declare the mappings. For example, you have, this is, this is, a, this is a C++ uh, object that we have um, declared uh, from our code, and, we, and it has one um, property, let's say, one field called symbols, and you just say that it should be mapped into this, it's actually array, you can see it from there, but it's actually array, or from the, uh, from the file, the JSON file, and that's all, the mapping has been done. And then you just use this overridden um, operator to, to do the actual parsing. So, when you really dive into that, there's a lot of things possible. I really encourage you to go through the manuals and standards and other documentation because uh, it's pretty awesome, uh, even just for a read, and also it's very, it comes very handy if you're interested in, 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 in making something yourself. And before we move into the, thing, the, 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 the part that I would really like you to maybe like, come and participate uh, with me, so the pros and cons, a uh, few practical tips. First thing, uh, the compiler and LVM are written in C++ 11, and it's, it's difficult to write anything without knowing anything about C++. <laughs> I know because I tried, and then I had to <laughs> learn, um, read two books about the topic. Uh, I found the language pretty awesome. Last time I used any C++, it was like in 2005, so a lot has changed in that. It's not the mod most modern one, C++ 11, but it's still modern enough. Um, but yeah, uh, it might require some time to get familiar with, so take that into consideration. Um, second thing, um, the IDE that is really nicely integrated with the Swift build process is uh, Xcode, it won't really surprise you, uh, and it works really well. I mean, I've tried to open it in, <laughs> I've tried uh, to open it in C-Lion, I couldn't make it uh, read all the configuration flags that uh, the Swiss compiler uses. Uh, CMake has also interface, um, the ability to generate the projects that you can open in Eclipse. <coughs> if, you, if, if Eclipse is your thing, go for it, it wasn't mine. Um, so I used Xcode, basically. Uh, third, there is no stable ABI yet, so if you want to parse the source code that imports some other module, and this module was compiled using some other version of the compiler that the one that you are linking against, it will just tell you, sorry, we cannot do that. This is the same uh, message that you get when you, for example, has um, build your cartridge dependencies, and then you've um, you've downloaded uh, the new Xcode, and now it says that you cannot really import those cartridge dependencies before you re, um, rebuild it. So this is the same thing. Um, so yeah, you, if if you need to build some dependencies before doing the analysis, just make sure you keep the same version of compiler, uh, the one that you are working with, and the Xcode ones, and also. Uh, I really encourage you to not let be scared away by not knowing much about compilers. I do not know very much about compilers, uh, but you don't need to because you're not writing compiler probably. You are just writing something else. For example, the strange refactoring that we did. So you can basically uh, make it, wing it somehow uh, without knowing very, very much about the compiler architecture. So, now that you know that you can do that, the question is, uh, should you, should you? And uh, it's not really that obvious. The first pro is basically the most 
uh, the one that I've been talking about for most of the time here, you can do a lot of things when you link against the compiler, but those lips are not really designed for you. These are designed for compilation, not for whatever you're doing. Um, and it sometimes makes it a little bit tricky to get all the things that you want. For example, the AST has all the information that we need, but sometimes the information was really hidden deep within some strange node hierarchy uh, in, the, in the fields that we've like, basically never knew to uh, look into, just because the AST is not designed for us to get all the symbols. The AST is designed for the Swift intermediate language generation after the, um, after the semantic analysis. So yeah, sometimes you need to really uh, hack it, hack your way around. Um, good thing is that there are many, many tools available, especially from LLVM. LLVM has like, basically like re-implementation of half the standard libraries. <laughs> like crazy, crazy amount of things that are basically always designed to work with their own domain, which is um, big source files, big buffers, uh, not copying as, uh, copying as little as possible and so on. Uh, and yes, many of them are really, really uh, nice to use. Although this is probably the most um, important drawback. <laughs> Anything that you are using can change anytime. So if you want to make like a product out of that, uh, you're basically uh, transformed yourself into the Swift uh, compiler developer because you need to take care of the code. You need to own it, like really. Um, so anything that comes into the repository, the Swift repository uh, can break your uh, code in any way. Uh, yeah, which maybe it, it may or may not be a problem for for your for your particular tools. It will definitely be for hours if we ever uh, really support it uh, for a longer time. The good thing is also that you can leverage so much of the existing infrastructure, especially in terms of the build process. I've just shown you how little do you need to do to create new libraries and new uh, command line tools, but you must also fit into it. So it's not really that easy, I guess, to uh, create any arbitrary, um, for example, tool like, I don't know, Mac app uh, that will integrate the compiler directly. It's probably possible, although uh, it will be definitely taking more steps than just adding a few files to a few uh, directories, as I, saw, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I showed you. And the nice thing is that you can probably I mean, you can for sure um, uh, support both Swift and Objective-C just because Clang is a part of the Swift compiler. It's, it's, it's linked uh, into the LLVM, which um, is linked into the Swift compiler. So you can basically like take the Clang uh, libraries and use them as well. Although there might be some better alternatives. I mean, this is not the only way. And those alternatives have one, usually they have one very, very big advantage, and the one that is about the API. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> for example, uh, the one that is pretty new, when we were starting with Obfuscator, it was basically like not working. It's, it should be working, from what I've heard at least, uh, it's working pretty well right now. So there's already a um, library that has been exposed, let's say, to the, to the uh, outer consumer uh, called lib syntax that is providing you with a lot of information that are from the uh, AST, but without really um, the need to parse the AST, which is pretty nice because then they are way easier to obtain and way more straightforward. Also, there is source kit. And SourceKit is under the hood, of course, calling the same libraries, but it has a stable API and it's stable enough and verbose, I mean, uh, enough and yeah, there's enough of functionality to build like so successful tools uh, out of it. So the Sorcerer is built uh, with SourceKit underneath, uh, SwiftLint, as I said, and many others. And also there, before you 
let's say, really try to make like a really product out of the Swift compiler tool, just look at the existing ones because there might be uh, some tool with some flag that's already doing something similar to, to what you've imagined. There is way more possibilities in those uh, command line tools already available that you've probably ever uh, heard about. So, <laughs> summing up, whether you will decide to uh, go the route that I showed you or not, is up to you. But even if you used any other uh, approach, like the, uh, the ones that I've just listed at the alternative uh, list, I hope at least that this presentation will give you some inspiration to what can be built using the Swift compiler. Uh, I mean. From my perspective, uh, we are really lacking good developer tools for Swift. For example, when comparing to some other languages like Python or Java, I mean, maybe, for example, there might be some good visualization tool, uh, maybe something that analyzes your code and uh, calculates some metrics and, and just gives you some, some nice score. Um, there is, for example, a possibility maybe just using AST, maybe not, uh, to make a migrator, migrator between the library vers versions, the same, that, uh, the same way that you are migrating between the language versions. Maybe you can write one that, for example, helps people migrate from Rx Swift 3 to 4 or something else. And um, also one thing that the AST directly might be very handy to create uh, that I thought of was transpiler or anything that really takes the Swift code and transpile it into some other language. I guess that it would be way easier to transpile from the AST than from, um, from any other format. And um, if you decide that you want to build something yourself or you're just interested after the presentation, um, we are in the process of open sourcing <laughs> the Swift Obfuscator. I mean, it's already available, as I uh, as it's stated here on the on the slide. Although we haven't really um, ensured uh, the whole infrastructure has been moved because we were using GitLab before. Now we're having GitHub. We are not having the CI that we are using before, and so on. So there's like a number of things that we are still working on. Uh, I hope they will be done within two weeks, but. Uh, in the meanwhile, you can always look at the source code just for inspiration. Look, look into the documentation folder. Um, we have put a lot of effort into creating uh, notes for most of the things that we found interesting, amusing, or scary when we were working <laughs> with the uh, uh, with the Swift compiler. So this is. Uh, I hope it will be an interesting read if you're interested. And uh, when you do decide to download it, just remember, this is not like a universal tool. It's basically, as I said, designed to work with one particular app. There's a lot of things missing. But you can always become a contributor, which I really encourage you to. Um, and yeah, help to, to move this project into something that is more uh, uh, universal and production ready. And at the very end, I would like to give credits to where credits are due. Uh, Katzberg uh, was the person that did like most of the initial work, the conceptual one, uh, most of the initial research for the Swift, com Swift, compi Swift, Swift Obfuscator and how to, how to build it. So uh, a lot of the conceptual work that's behind what we built was, uh, was uh, done by him. So please let me know. You can use this um, Twitter handle if you're interested in anything that I've presented tonight. And uh, are there any questions? Yeah, uh, I have a question. If you ship an app uh, with the obfuscated symbols, how does it affect your crash noise and crash reports? Can you reverse engineer them to the original yeah. symbols? Or? Yeah, so as I said, this is uh, something that we are still missing because, I mean, the crash report before it's, sim that it's symbolized, it's just the addresses, right? <coughs> so uh, you need the DSM file to the symbolize, the symbol, the symbolificate, whatever. And 
you are, can get it from the compilation process, but if you have never compiled the, answer, the unobfuscated source code, then you do not have this file. So basically, this is something that we are still missing. We have made quite a long research trying to think of uh, whether can we just transform the decimal file uh, and replace the symbols inside the decimal file as well. And this is surprisingly complicated format. I really encourage you to look into it if you're interested. Um, the documentation is like, I, I don't know, 200 pages long. It's crazy. It's crazy how many things are uh, there. Uh, so basically we thought that, yeah, um, this is something for the future uh, work. Why do you want to, to modify the decimal file while you can in the use of the process? You've decimal from uh, your uh, obfuscated source and uh, I don't know, use your list of uh, obfuscation symbols. Yeah, so this is, this is the road that we've, uh, com that we've, that we've taken uh, during this research after the initial, um, the initial decimal file. Um, uh, try and uh, we haven't just made it working yet. I mean, you are basically parsing another string file, and you need to 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 replace all the symbols. Uh, this is the this is the approach that is way more manageable, and we haven't just um, made made it available yet. As I said, basically because this was done to uh, for a particular app, and this app we could just build. Of the non-obfuscated version as well. So, yeah. Was it a requirement of the the company for this for this app? That they um, Is that why you had to do it? It wasn't really a requirement. It was something that um, the client really was like interested into, and. This is like a long story, but uh, to make it short, Poly Polydia used to have an uh, obfuscator for Objective-C. And for the whole time uh, since Swift came out, people are still asking whether there will be a version for Swift. So for, from time to time, when another person asks, we are just thinking, OK, so is it possible already? Is there like a nice approach for it? And we try to, to, to make it work in. And I guess this was the most successful of the three approaches that we did uh, in the last four years, I guess, for the clients. And yeah, it wasn't a requirement per se. Yeah, but it was something that we really wanted to look into, just because we know that there are people that do want to have this tool. I, as I said, uh, it's not something that really prevents the attack from the skill attacker, but this is something that it's still usable, especially if you're working in this particular industries like the banking industry or something like this. I mean, especially that on Android, there is ProGuard, and you can have the obfuscated app on Android, even though, I mean, the main purpose of ProGuard is basically to make your um, to shrink your app, right? To make it, to make it smaller. Uh, people are still looking into the obfuscation on uh, Swift side as well. Yeah. And by the way, we, we do have the uh, option for shrinking the iOS app, so for just generating the shorter symbol, although the change is like 1.4% for the update we <laughs> <laughs> tested, so it's not really that uh, huge. Yeah. <laughs> and this, is, is, is the app released in the App Store with the obfuscation? Yeah, it, it has passed the review. It okay. wasn't really... Okay, so it's passed review, but yeah. you don't know yet. That's to do with the same question that, uh, that Adrian asked. And has it made support for Arnold? Uh, yes, it has. Uh, it's not yet in the Arnold release, but it's in the Arnold release. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, last year, uh, there, was, there was this moment that some apps that were obfuscated were... Um, been rejected from the App Store review process. Yeah, there was, there was like a month of that, and then it just went away. And I wonder whether it was like another of those mystical App Store uh, refusal um, seasons, you know, that sometimes there's like a moment that, for example, someone thinks that the uh, emojis are not okay for the App Store, and now for one month, a lot of emoji apps are out, and then after a while, 
everything comes back to normal. And there was a moment like that for the obfuscated apps as well. So we just really, really wanted to put it through the uh, App Store review and, and be sure that it passes App Store review, it's ready for deployment. Yeah. Factoring API in the compiler. Is it possible to write a lot of that uses just this public refactoring API that Apple provides, or does it require this advanced insight into the compiler? Yeah, so um, we did the. Okay, so I think that the refactoring API that, uh, that you are mentioning is this Swift IDE uh, library, basically, and it's great for doing the actual uh, changes in the source files, although it will not give you all the information that you need. Uh, you can probably use a source kit. And we, I mean, we did the initial research and the source kit was missing some of the information that we, that we required for some particular Swiss construct. But we haven't never really tried the lib syntax because... Yeah, what I mean is that, like, from what I saw, this is basically the obfuscation is basically two tools combined. One is rename symbols and the other one is rename all its code. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. My question is whether you can combine, like if it's yeah. possible to rename a yeah. simple so app, can you combine these two tools to obfuscate them? The renaming uh, itself is like the... The renaming is the easy part. Uh, in a, uh, uh, the hard part is to have the information to decide whether you should or should not rename the symbol, and also to know whether two symbols with the same name are really the same symbols. So, for example, I mean the, the, the easiest thing is just you have two classes with the same method uh, name. So, to maximize, let's say, the entropy <laughs> of the obfuscated code, you want to transform them into different uh, random strings, right? Yeah, I thought the uh, refactoring API handles that. Yeah, I don't think it does really. Yeah, although although I must admit I haven't really. This research was done basically like half an hour ago, uh, half an hour, <laughs> half a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was here half an hour, so <laughs> it wasn't possible. <laughs> so half a year ago, and uh, things might have changed since that. Especially, uh, I'm I'm very interested in the, in this lips uh, uh, lips syntax uh, library because yeah, I know that this is something that. <coughs> There was, there was a lot of work put into uh, in the last three to four months, I guess. And yeah, and this, is, this is something that I've already, I've already seen a tool that's basically like generating a very simple uh, AST out of the lib syntax, which is pretty awesome. So maybe it, it will be like a more stable way to, to approach the problem. Any other questions? So if not, uh, thank you very much. As I said, uh, let me know if uh, you're interested in, in, in this uh, approach. Thank you.